Good afternoon and welcome. I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Andrew Basenecker and I have the privilege of moving our discussion along today. So I'm going to be moderating and facilitating our discussion because I know there's going to be a lot of questions, a lot of insights from our panelists who we'll introduce here in just a few minutes. And we certainly want to hear from everybody that came today what questions and what insights you have to offer. Some brief introductions. We are privileged and honored to have a representative from Congressman Joe Neguse's office here with us today. We have Sally Anderson, who serves as the District Director for Congressman Joe Neguse. We also have one of our elected officials here with us today, Representative Kathy Kipp, who serves in House District 52. And then we have a wealth of knowledge and experience and insight from our panelists today. So I'm going to introduce, introduce you all one by one and then invite you to join us up front so that we can kind of pass this microphone along for uh, answers to questions. So we'll start with um, Dr. Kathy Egan, who is a family physician with, for the past 30 years, whose specialty has been to work with the underserved and community health centers, first in Washington, D.C., and for the last 13 years, for Sunrise at the Loveland Community Health Center. She has struggled to provide quality comprehensive health care to her patients who are uninsured and underinsured and has become an advocate for health care reform in the United States. Did I get it? All right. <laughs> Dr. Carol Ting is also with us here today. And uh, Carol is a board certified in family medicine. Um, and after 30 years in private practice, she's been working for the last nine years in a rural hospital district, primarily as an emergency physician. It's the only healthcare facility for 6,000 square miles. And as you can imagine, is struggling to continue to uh, provide critical services for a vulnerable population. Doctor, thank you for joining us today. And then we also have Anders Fremstad. Did I get the last name right? My last name is Basenecker, so I never carry a whole lot of guilt about <laughs> last names. And Anders is a professor at CSU in economics, is going to be really helpful to our discussion in um, sort of unpacking some of those how much is this going to cost questions, among other things. So we are going to start our time together with two videos, which will give us, I think, some opportunity and maybe a catalyst for a few questions and reactions. And then as those questions come about, we'll pass the microphone through to our panelists and invite them to sort of engage those uh, different insights you have to offer. Thanks, Andy. And thank everyone for being here. Um, I mean, the video gets at the crux of it, right? If you take into account what the government already pays for health care and what we all pay for health care, both in our premiums and our co-pays, we already pay more than, than almost every country in the world, right? 17.2% um, of GDP in the United States goes to health care now. That's compared to 9.7% in Britain, 10.3% in Canada, 11.3% in Germany. So we're already paying 50 to 100% more than, than other advanced nations. Um, the Medicare for All bill, there's been a recent um, report done by the Political Economy Research Institute um, in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, they say if we implemented the plan that Bernie Sanders has been um, pushing forward, that would actually reduce our ex total expenditures on, on health care to about 15.8% of GDP. So they're not actually thinking it's going to reduce it a ton. We're not, we're not, we're not suggesting we get all the way down to Britain, Canadian, or German levels, but it's going to reduce it to save the average family in the United States about 9% of their money. Um, how is that possible? The reason that's possible is that a lot of time right now in hospitals and clinics and so on is devoted to billing. Um, and a lot of our time as patients, which isn't even taken into account in the cost of our healthcare system, is also devoted to billing and calling your insurance company and calling your, your doctor to try to find out what things are going to cost you. Um, so that's where the vast majority of these savings are. Um, that's why we're able in Medicare for All to actually expand services by 12%. Um, to bring in folks who are uninsured or underinsured today while still bringing down the average cost for folks um, by about 9%, according to the study at the Political Economy Research Institute. I think it might be useful to, to, to quickly think about what this looks like on an individual basis. So I want to just share with you, I'm one of the lucky folks in the current system who has insurance through the job. I'm a professor at Colorado State University, right? Um, currently, the premiums that CSU and I pay through Blue Cross Blue Shield are 16% of my salary, right? Um, this is a huge amount of money, right? But this is, I'm one of the lucky ones. 
right? Um, but for us, it's 16% of our salary. Um, we have a $2,000 deductible, 20% coinsurance rates, and $12,000 max out of pocket. Um, Medicare for all would even save people like me money. Um, and the savings are even larger for people earning lower incomes um, or people who don't currently have health insurance through their work. So um, the savings are quite large. I can get into more details and so on. But, but the fact of the matter is, I mean, a lot of you who support Medicare for All probably do so for the moral reason that was really put forward, I think, in the first video. There's no reason that in a country like the United States, anyone should die for lack of health coverage. Um, but the economic case is strong as well. The amount of waste and fraud in our current system is astounding. Um, and by taking that, fixing that, we can actually expand coverage to everyone while reducing the total cost uh, to Americans. Yeah, so the question is, what, what does the financing of Medicare for All look like? Because obviously it's going to cost us something, so, so how do we pay for it? Right now, uh, the, the bill um, analyzed by the Political Economy Research Institute right, suggests an 8.2% payroll tax. Um, so you can think of that kind of as right now I'm paying effectively 16% between me and my employer. We'd pay 8.2% instead. Um, that would be paid actually on the employer side, although most economists think it doesn't matter whether or not you pay one side or the other because it's always money that's essentially coming out of your paycheck. Um, they also have a 3.75% um, sales tax. Um, and then a net worth tax for folks who have more than a million dollars of 0.38% um, and a change in taxation of long-term capital gains so that those get taxed at the same rate as you'd pay in your in otherwise pay. Um, so for most folks, um, essentially we're talking about an 8.2% payroll tax and an extra 3.7% um, um, sales tax. The payroll tax would be paid actually by the employer, so theoretically, at least low-income people wouldn't really see that themselves. Um, but of course, we would see the sales tax, and that is something. They, for for low-income people, there's actually a deduction there that kind of wipes that out. But if you add those up, so for someone like me, right, currently, between me and my employer, we're paying 16%. With Medicare for All, we'd pay the 8.2 plus 3 point si uh, about 12%. So actually, my savings, I think, would be larger than the 9% that, uh, that Perry estimates. Good. So let's start with these two questions. Um, the payroll tax piece, um, we can start there. And then I think we can maybe pass the mic down to our panelists to talk a little bit about what an med improved Medicare for All system has to offer versus bolstering the ACA, which is, seems to be the second question that you um, had as well. Let's, let's start there with the payroll tax piece, and then we'll pivot. Yeah, so the 8.2% increase in the payroll tax is, I mean, that's a payroll tax increase. That's, not, that's, that's on top of what we already pay. Between you and your employer right now, if you're working, you're paying about 15% together, right? Um, so it'd be another 8%. I believe in the Sanders bill, that 8% falls on the employer's side. Although, again, in our economic models, it doesn't matter <laughs> what side you put it on. The workers pay it regardless. You know, so the 8.2% payroll tax would be an increase in the tax, right? Um, but again, I mean, 8.2% sounds like a lot. I mean, even for a high-income person like me, I'm paying 16% right now. I mean, so it's, you know, um, for someone making 20 or 30 or $40,000, um, you and your employer are paying way more than that even because health insurance in this country is very expensive compared to those wages. If you don't have it at all, then, then obviously Medicare for All is a benefit for those folks. So from my perspective, bolstering the ACA means that you keep in place the for-profit health insurance companies who have the incentive to not give the best care and keep in place the for-profit big pharma um, that, again, has the incentive to not keep costs down, and the device makers, if you have a spinal cord stimulator. So from my perspective, I choose Medicare for All because the Affordable Care Act was kind of a compromise keeping those um, profit-making uh, corporations in, in, in place who don't have my patients' interests in mind, but they have their shareholders' interests in mind. That is their bottom line, is, is, is making money. Even our not-for-profit hospital corporations make a lot of money. 
Good, so I'm gonna repeat the question for the video. First being the fact that a sales tax is regressive, especially on low income earners, and the second being the fact that Medicare reimbursement rates are a concern, obviously, for Medicare for All because a lot of providers won't accept those patients. Is that a fair summation? Okay, so who wants to start? I'll take the sales tax and then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should have actually clarified. So, I mean, a sales tax is regressive, so this is a great point. Um, so the sales tax in the Medicare for All bill that Bernie Sanders has put forward actually ex doesn't um, impose it on necessities, um, food and gasoline and so on. So it wouldn't be at least as of regressive of a tax as, as an ordinary sales tax. Um, and... You know, I mean, there is a question, right? I mean, we could fund Medicare for All in an even more progressive way than Bernie Sanders has put forward. Um, but I think, I mean, the comment before about the skin in the game, um, I think it's, um, if you're a payroll tax, I mean, you know, that's a flat tax. In general, I'm not a big proponent of flat taxes. But here we're talking about flat tax instead of what currently is an extremely regressive healthcare financing system where um, poor people are essentially paying way higher fractions of their income for insurance relative to the well-off. Um, so the difference, it's true. Um, many, of, many of us, you who have Medicare, know that there are providers in the community that do not take Medicare. However, in Medicare for All, we will all have Medicare for All, and so Doctors will need, if they want to get paid, to take Medicare for all. Um, that will be their, their payer source. They're, they're kind of, it, it, it will be a, a big difference. And, um, you know, I, I think, again, transitions are difficult. They're challenging. But again, um, in terms of that payment, you know, at the negotiating table, if physicians are saying, you know, we're, you know, we can't survive, then, you know, Medicare for all will have to improve those payments at a reasonable level um, to keep everyone in the game because all of us are at stake. You know, I, I've had the uh, kind of the perspective of going all the way from strictly private practice in the 1980s um, and now working in a publicly financed critical access hospital. And for people that don't understand that, that is actually a, a form fruist of what we're talking about. Uh, critical access hospitals were funded in 1997 by the Reconciliation Act. And what it is, is it's a criteria for a hospital for public funding that um, is provided by the government, that they meet certain criteria, that they have physicians available, that they have nurses available, that they accept anybody who presents, regardless of paying. The hospital that I work at is also a publicly funded hospital district, which means that the residents in the area voted for a tax increase to cover the hospital and to cover the facilities. So in a sense, and we have something called a 340B program, which is funded by the government, which is subsidized pharmaceutical benefits. So an inhaler that in the private market is gonna cost you $450, my patient can get for $1.50. So there is a system that already exists which is, has been here for 30 years and has been reasonably successful, although now as things have been pulled out from under them, the, the, these facilities aren't doing as well. But at the same time, the, the physicians are of the understanding that they are there to take care of patients and they get paid. Um, and it's independent of whether they, are, whether they are seeing 50 patients or five patients. And I think that's the system that will begin to develop as, as people understand that, the, that this public basis for funding for healthcare actually can work. And those people in the rural areas who ironically were probably the most anti-government people in the universe right. actually understand that and vote for their own best interest to raise taxes. Wonderful. So just to repeat the question, any data about physicians um, who don't accept Medicare, um, private practice versus folks who are perhaps in a healthcare system which won't accept Medicare? Is that a fair summation? Good. Okay. Two things. One, the number of private practitioners is dropping drastically. I mean, most of most people now, I forget the exact statistic in primary care, I think it's 40%, are now employees. So they are like me. I'm being paid by a hospital system. 
Um, and of those employers, most of them are public entities. They cannot refuse to take Medicare. So, you know, you go to UC Health. They actually have to take Medicare. It's by law. So the laws do work. I think that, you know, sometimes the grousing that you hear from private doctors is primarily grousing because in the, at the end of the day, the laws do support taking care of people with Medicare. So, so just to summarize for the video, your total cost here would have been well over $5,000 by the time you actually saw a doctor just to get there $5,000 versus $500 for an ambulance ride in Germany and 100 and uh, some change for actually seeing a couple specialists. I, uh, yeah, I've had exactly the same experience. We were in London, in Cambridge. My husband had an anaphylactic reaction. And we went to the local emergency room where he was treated very well, was there for three hours. We went to leave and said, what do we owe you? And they said nothing because of the contingent plan that they had. I was shocked. But uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's a real experience. And take the, take the exception, I, I helicopter people out from my work a lot. I know every time I call the helicopter, that's $18,000 to get that patient to Grand Junction, which is a 30-minute flight. So the, the comment, and I'm going to summarize just for the video, is that the healthcare Germany uh, system in Germany is not a single payer system, but it is a heavily regulated not-for-profit system, which clearly you can see that there's probably a lot of ways to get at this, right? And a lot of ways, but what we know is what I think we've all experienced and our friends and family have all experienced is what's happening now isn't working. And it puts people in jeopardy. So the story is that of being abroad and having an injury and having a doctor come to your house and make a house call. And I wonder um, maybe if that's an opportunity for our physicians in particular to chime in on the number of folks you see that have delayed or put off care because of cost. Would you mind maybe just sharing an experience or two? Uh, the one I, that, call, that comes to mind is, you know, I worked, in the, I worked in the emergency room and I had a gentleman come in saying he was having trouble swallowing, and he'd been told previously if that happened, he needed to seek care. And he had a massive tumor on the side of his mouth, his throat. And I looked at him and I said, well, you know, you really should have some testing done. And he said, that's what the last doctor said. Uh, and I said, he, and the last doctor said, I should probably see a cancer doctor because it was probably lymphoma. And this is a patient telling me this. And I said, they're absolutely right, and you should see a to have your testing done, and you should see it. Another doctor, he said, well, I think that I'm okay because I can still talk to you, and I can't do those things because I'm not going to pay for it. And to me at that time, you know, the ACA had been in its, uh, it was kind of in its heyday, and I said, look, it's still open enrollment. Why don't you sign up? You could sign up today. You could get care, but, you know, within a month if, at the minimum. Why aren't you going to do that? He says, I won't take anything from the government was his response. You know, and, and to me, that's something that is, is part of the behavioral economics of what we're going to be dealing with uh, in, 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 the, in the process of trying to convince people that they do have skin in the game because this is a tax-funded operation. Um, I was reading a, a, an article by uh, Atul Gwande, who's the gentleman who is, uh, is a, has been put in charge of this corporate revamping of healthcare. And he, his article is called, Is Healthcare a Right? And, and the thing that he was talking about is an experience he had going back to his hometown of Athens, Ohio, where he had encountered a woman who had this medical catastrophic event happen, but then she went on Medicare. And she was saying that, you know, all of these things that had happened prior to going on Medicare, you know, she had all these bills, and people were taking too much from the government, and how come she had to pay for all of this health care when other people were able to get it free? And his question to her is, well, what about Medicare? And her response was something to the effect, well, I contributed to that. Wonderful. So just to paraphrase for our video, the social responsibility of the government inside of health care to provide health care for their citizens and that being something that the government is responsible for. And then also your comments, which I think are equally as important, that it's not free, right? You pay into it, but you also have a system which then covers everybody. 
So just to paraphrase, this healthcare becomes an equity and justice issue, especially for folks who are low-income earners who cannot afford a $500, $200, any dollar, that free at the point of service is really one of the main benefits of improved Medicare for all. I think that's a great question, and it's part of why we're here today, is how uh, to, uh, to name some of these things that you're going to hear that are common sort of pushback to an improved Medicare for all system, and that is, how do you keep people from abusing the system? From so I'll give you a little historical perspective. I work in a community health center where many of my patients are lower income so that many patients when the ACA came into um, being got Medicaid. And so I as a prim primary care provider did not see in my clinic uh, a huge influx of people. What I did see was people coming with long lists of things they had been unable to address because they had no health insurance and they had a list of things that they needed to do preventively and also curatively to evaluate these things they had not uh, been able to take care of. There are frequent flyers and if we are, as a healthcare system, smart, we sit down together and we say, how do we decrease emergency utilization? And we've, we find that we get case managers who visit people in their homes who have high mental health needs and will go to the ER, you know, with a hangnail. We have phone nurses who we pay that people can call on the phone when they're having a panic attack or something so they're not in the ER. If we're smart about it, and as a system we all want to save money, we can decrease overutilization. Um, that's that's my personal perspective. And and from my perspective, again, I've been on both sides. I've been on the you know, I, I, I not to be belittling, but it's like a widget business. The more you see, the more you do get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to being actually able to treat people appropriately order the appropriate testing. Currently in our system, there is 18% overutilization, as is, primarily because of the widget side. And if we eliminate the widget side, there's going to be less of that service for profit on the one hand. The second part of that is that there are people who use the system too much. There's no doubt about that. My understanding about the, the, the basic coverage is that there will still be basic coverage. And I don't know if they're going to use the European sick fund model or not. If we, I mean, they, these are elements of the, of the Medicare for all I don't quite get myself. So we, we're going to cover basic services, but there are going to be things that are not going to be covered, and I'm not quite sure where those are going to go. I, I don't see that we're going to, and, and many studies have been done, and I'm sure that, that, that Dr. Egan can relate to this, that even when somebody goes on Medicaid, we do not see them more often than the average patient. Um, there, like she says, there are always the frequent flyers. That is an issue with the provider being able to provide education about not doing that. But, but there was not an increase in utilization when people got Medicaid. So these frequent flyers you might see in the emergency room versus preventative medicine, which might keep them out of the emergency room. Is there data to su support that? Yeah, there is data for that. Then, and you know, again, you know, and, and actually, interestingly, adding the mental health component to coverage helps prevent that a lot, because much of what we deal with are people who are there for other reasons than my throat hurts. And I can add to that as well. I was a chaplain uh, at NCMC in Greeley for a number of years, and typically in the emergency rooms on Friday nights and on weekends, um, we had a number of folks who would come in. And I'll tell you what I did. I was usually partnered with our social worker who was on call at the time, and the two of us would try to sort out how we could help this individual, um, who we would then see next weekend and the weekend after that. And the mental health component is a huge piece of that, as is preventative medicine. I can't quantify that. I just know what I've seen. I am the Congressman's District Director based here in Fort Collins. Um, we have an office where um, Congressman Polis's was at college in Pitkin, so welcome you all to come by. I don't have business cards yet, we're still getting set up, but um, find me after and make sure I um, get my email so we can continue to connect on all of this. I think there's a lot of good movement into you know 
talk about your point when Senator Sanders first introduced this idea of Medicare for all wasn't very popular. But now we have, I think we have 80 or so co-sponsors in the House before the bill has even been introduced. Imagine that there will be even more. And we're getting, there's a, just a lot more momentum around it, which I think is exciting. And so, so the congressman supports Medicare for all. He's been working on it. He definitely thinks that health care is a right and not a privilege and that everyone should have access to quality, accessible health care. It's incredibly important. So there are a couple things happening at the federal level. So we have this bill that's hopefully coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, you'll be able to find that online once it gets a um, bill number assigned to it and be able to read through all of it and kind of track its progress. And so he has also signed on to a piece of legislation that would significantly cut the price of prescription drugs. So that is also happening right now in the U.S. House. As far as this bill and the way we understand it, um, so it would cover or reduce overhead administrative costs, and it would focus investments on healthcare training, and it would also eliminate out-of-pocket costs for everyone, so that includes premiums, co-pays, deductibles, and it would also put a lot of restrictions on drug companies and cover prescription drug costs as well. So logistically, this would mean you could still keep your doctor. They would still, there's no such thing as being in network or out of network. You would have access to whoever you would want and whatever hospitals you would want as well. So it's kind of the, the basic update I have from a legislative point of view, and I'm glad we have all these experts up here to dive more in depth. But again, happy to connect with you all and to continue this discussion as a, we see it move through the Congress. So thanks. I don't think I've heard Congressman DeGoose speak once without him mentioning improved Medicare for all and his support for that. And I think we all benefit from his advocacy on the federal level on our behalf. So thank you, Sally, for being here with us today. How would you improve the bill as you understand it right now? So maybe one tweak you might make or an improvement you might make to the current uh, proposed improved Medicare for all bill. That's a great question, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I see the Medicare for All as so much improvement upon what we have now that, that, uh, that I'm afraid I can't tell you <laughs> what I would change. You know, as I'm reading this, the one part of this that I still would like to see is more focus on the, oh, what did Obama call it, nudging, where you actually need to present your case in a better form for people. I mean, that, I think that was the ACA's issue. Um, and, and it seems to me that by addressing the fact that there's going to be massive resistance, and I don't know if you do that legislatively or what, um, I think that if the bill is written and, and is, has any chance of succeeding, there need to be some caveats or some legislative elements that prevent it from being undermined the way that the ACA was undermined. We have such a for-profit um, system in place there's no way this is going to be easy. It's going to take lots of grassroots work, and we're up against big money in, in pharma, in insurance companies, in corporation, hospital corporations. So, um, yeah, we just need to convince more of our friends. <laughs> So the pushback is on the word socialism and the connotations around that. Of course, I think education is a huge piece of that. Um, what we mean when we say words matters. And I think that matters more than ever when we think about what we mean when we say health care. What do we really mean when we say that as a country, that we're a country that everybody has access to health care? Words matter, our meanings matter, and I would encourage you to focus speak with our DSA folks about the ways that they are reimagining and redefining those words for folks who maybe have a historical or generational negative connotation of that word. We have our work cut out for us, right, in educating the public about why an improved Medicare for all system is indeed the most beneficial system for our country. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has comments to that end. Um, but it's a reality. Um, I kind of always go back to those words from Margaret Mead that says something about, you know, a few citizens being engaged and uh, how they change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, right? So I think that's part of why we're here today. I want to just hand the mic over briefly to Elaine and then Julie again for some calls to action, ways that you can get engaged. Uh, but before we do that, let's give our panelists a hand. Several things coming up. 
is there's a lobby day down at the Capitol on Wednesday. Is, uh, we'll be meeting about 1045 and rally on the steps of the Capitol, march around the Capitol, and then um, be able to go inside and uh, meet with um, our legislators. And um, there is a bill that is being presented, which is called the Health Care Analysis Act of 2019. And this, this act is going to include universal health care coverage. And, and we've had kind of a campaign about keeping universal health care on the table because somehow <laughs> it gets neglected. So we need to uh, talk to legislators, talk to your neighbors to talk to their legislators and um, so that we make sure that that's included and, and we get really an overall analysis of um, how, how in Colorado we can uh, support health care. Several things is um, the foundation has a really good website with lots of material on there. And if you, if you go up there, um, the material has the website on it, co-universalhealth.org. Here in Fort Collins or in Larimer County, we have um, a Facebook page. And um, so we keep you up to date. And then um, I also um, send out information on a Google group. And if you sign up there and there's a little spot that you can check off and I'll include your name about all the activities that we do. And, and a, a really fun thing, so we can start planning, is, um, is the 4th of July parade. And that was a really terrific experience. And people were so excited and cheering. And um, it, it really, people are concerned and people care, so. Wendell Potter, who is, um, he was an executive and was a whistleblower about insurance companies. He's written a lot of books and he's really an expert and he is so on board with our movement. So he, he's a great leader and he's going to be the keynote speaker at our annual meeting this summer on June 29th. So if you sign up, you'll get lots of information. I uh, just want to let you know that the DSA Medicare for All website has all the information that I've given you and more. And their big push to change from going from canvassing and talking to your neighbors, which should continue, is to, uh, it's called a house pressure campaign. So what we're trying to do, because I don't know if you're familiar, but there's a representative named Pramila Jayapal who is reintroducing the new Medicare for All bill in the house. And that's coming soon. I don't know an exact date. But we are trying to get representatives because now they're going to all have to sign up again. So we have to get on our representatives next and make them sign up. So that's going to be part of the campaign. We do have a um, list where you can sign up where I can send you more information later um, as to how you can, which representatives um, you can reach and how to reach them. So we'd be happy to have you join us. You're also welcome to come to any of our meetings where we discuss this, when we have Canvas campaigns. We also have a Facebook page. And I, because we work so closely together, almost everything that I post, I'm also posting in the Larimer County Healthcare Action. So we're connected. Yeah. <laughs>